you made it through the vortex. <laughs> I'm going to edify Richard Wesley. All right. Okay. So, <laughs> Richard Wesley is a screenwriter. He's a playwright. He's a professor at NYU Tisch School of the Arts, mm -hmm. the Department yep. of uh, Dramatic Writing. Department of Dramatic Writing, yes. He is a friend and a colleague, of course, of the late Lee Chamberlain, which is why he's here today. Um, I'm just going to mention some of the things that he's done because your, your biography is pretty much endless. Um, but <laughs> let's see, some of the screenplays that you've written, Native Son. Yes. Uh, the screenplay for Mandela and De Klerk. Murder Without yeah. Motive, mm -hmm. 100 Center Street, Bojangles. Oh, that was a television series. I just wrote a couple of episodes for them. Okay. Blase, blase. <laughs> and then, of course, Uptown Saturday Night and Let's Do It Again, which were both uh, directed by the legend Sidney Poitier, with a yes. that included, of course, Denise, Denise Nicholas, Ozzie Davis, Calvin Lockhart, the notorious Bill Cosby and Lee Chamberlain. So I want to give a warm welcome to you, Mr. Wesley, and thank you for joining us today in spite of all the obstacles in this uh, kind of walk down memory lane and tribute to Lee. So I'm just going to get, get right into it and ask you mm -hmm. uh, what the atmosphere was like at the time of coming together to do a film like Let's Do It Again and Uptown Saturday Night, which, you know, in their own way were groundbreaking. It was the uh, early, uh, the early 70s um, uh, when I came uh, onto that project, or when Sydney hired me, it was, that was 1973. And um, the uh, black film movement had been pretty much underway for at least uh, four or five years at that point. Uh, Hollywood uh, had started uh, as early as 1967, 1968, uh, releasing black-themed films. Um, Could you uh, those films? The only film that comes to mind to me, but I'm not that... I'm not as, uh, you know, I'm not that old, you know, mm -hmm. I'm to remember. <laughs> but the first thing I remember that came up on my radar was In the Heat of the Night. And that was starring uh, Sidney Poitier and... Yes, Carol. Rod Steiger. Is that the film that you're referring to? or is No, it no, it, uh, it's not. Uh, Sidney's, Sidney's films were, um, I think... <sighs> In in terms of black history, uh, black film history in America, Sydney's films occupy a a particular kind of niche that's um, that's a little bit different from um, the kinds of commercial films um, that we might be thinking of. Sydney generally, uh, his career, uh, he's noted for usually being the only black presence in the films that he was in. Or, or, or if there were other black characters, he was the one who was sort of like one of the stars and the other black characters in the films were feature characters who came in and out. Uh, you might only see them in one scene or two. The kind of film I'm talking about is a film like um, Cool Breeze, uh, uh, Thalmas Rasalala's uh, film, um, uh, which was basically a remake of Asphalt Jungle a uh, film noir slash gangster slash uh, action film from the early 1950s. And it was remade in the late 1960s with Thalmas Razalala in, uh, in, in the lead role. Um, or Raymond St. Jock in um, If He Hollers, Let Him Go, uh, another uh, film that he made uh, uh, right around that same period of time called uh, Change of Mind, which... Uh, it's pretty much forgotten today, but is a kind of, uh, of, of the three films that I just mentioned, that one is perhaps one of the most provocative because it's a film, um, it's kind of a science fiction movie. Uh, St. Jock uh, basically plays um, 
uh, two characters in one. At the beginning of the film, um, there is an emergency operation being carried on in a hospital. Um, and there are two victims involved. Both um, uh, were killed in accidents just a few hours before uh, the film begins. A white man driving a car was killed in an automobile accident in which his body was almost completely destroyed, but his brain was intact. A black man was killed in an accident in which he suffered incredible head trauma, but his body is otherwise in perfect condition. So without, any, without asking any of the family's permission or anything, the surgeons have placed the brain of the white man in the black man's body. And so when he wakes up, Sounds like fun. who is he? Right. You know? And so the first half of the film is about a white man trying to continue to live his life inside that black body. And, no, and all of his friends can't adjust to it. The second part of the film is him going into the black community, trying to be a black man in the black community, and that's not working. And at the end of the film, he has to strike out on his own and forge a completely new identity. That, that particular film, um, I, you know, I, I, it's one that sort of stays with me. I, I still remember it. And that film was out before 1970. And uh -huh. then, of course, once you, once you get into the 70s, you're getting into Melvin's, uh, Melvin Van Peebles with Sweet Sweet Back. And uh, then later on, Lady Sings the Blues and... and um, Everything starts really starts, uh, you know, taking off from there. Hell up in Harlem, uh, adaptations of, of the novels Cotton Comes to Harlem, uh, and uh, films like that. And it was in that particular kind of milieu that Sidney approached me about writing um, a comedy film in which he was go uh, hoping to bring together all of the top black uh, comedians at the time. Mm -hmm. and. You know, have them star in the film, feature them in the film, uh, in the finished product. So we're talking about Uptown Saturday Night right now. That's yeah, and that's what Uptown Saturday Night was born into. Well, you know, I that so many thoughts. Um, I had the opportunity to actually meet Sydney personally. Mm -hmm. You, he graciously welcomed me into his home in uh, on May fifth of twenty sixteen. Okay. I wanted to, you know, just get his perspective and memories on on Lee, on Mom. Mm -hmm. And hearing you talk about the top comedians of, of the day, of course, Mom was doing the Electric Company, which is basically one big comedy show, you know, teaching kids how to read and write. And... But of course, I mean, the first role that he tapped her for, you know, was more, quote, of a dramatic role. And I remember she used to say that drama was easy, but that it was comedy that was difficult. Well, you know, um, even though it, it was a comedy, uh, you know, uh, and Sidney's original thrust was uh, to get nothing but comedians for the various roles uh, in the film. Um, over time, that approach ha had to change. When I wrote the script, Sidney only intended to direct the movie. He wasn't going to be in it. Um, the, the two roles, the two, the two lead male roles in the film were designed for Red Fox and Richard Pryor. Oh. Bill Cosby had read the script and he wanted to play Sharp Eye Washington. But Warner Brothers, um, felt a little uneasy about, they didn't know who all these comedians were. Richard Pryor was not a big national star at the time. And um, Cosby was primarily known for television and, and did have a, uh, have a following. So there, they felt there was, a, you know, Sidney was getting a lot of uh, feedback from the studio and the studio basically said, Sidney, the money to do this film is yours if you'll be in it. We'll feel much more comfortable about getting our money back if you're if you top line the film. I see. And um, so he later told me that's what happened. He 
you know, he, he uh, took over that role that would have gone to Red Fox. Hmm. Um, Richard had other commitments, so doing a, so being in, in the entire film was not as likely as maybe doing a small part. So Richard wound up doing uh, Sharp Eye Washington, which was just a cameo role. And Bill Cosby flipped over and did the part that Richard would have done. <laughs> wow. He needed a, 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 um, a more solid actress and someone, someone with a little more gravitas in a part like Madame Zenobia. Mm -hmm. And so when Sydney was looking, looking around for um, an actress to play that part, that's where your mother came through the door. I see, I see. And how did he know that my mother had a little bit more gravitas at that juncture? What's, what's the um, saying in, 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 in the, um, among the professional athletes? Game knows game. <laughs> See, your mother had a very, very, very solid reputation, and it was very, it was known even at that time that uh, the people who were working on Electric Company were, uh, you know, well, Cosby, uh, when I, you know, when I think back on it, Cosby would have told Sidney about your mother, because he was working with your mother on Electric Company at that time. True. And she had a very solid reputation in New York, um, as did Morgan Freeman, as did uh, Rita Moreno, everybody who was in, uh, involved in that um, cast uh, for that show back mm. then. Yeah. So that's how things gradually came together. You know who would be really good for this role? You need to talk to this actress, Lee Chamberlain, back in New York. Word? Yeah, you really need to, you, you need to go down and really check her out. I see. I see. Huh. That's interesting. You yeah. know, people have those conversations, you know, and, 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 and it could be something as, you know, you know, just like that because Sydney was auditioning for, for, um, for different roles at that time. I see. Uh, your mother was also, um, I think she was friends, uh, with Rosalind Cash. And so Sydney would have asked Rosalind, mm. what do you think about Lee Chamberlain? And, and Rosalind would have told, would have told uh, him the, exactly the same thing that I know Bill Cosby told him. Well, they, Rosalind Cash and Ellen Holly and my mother mm -hmm. were in a production of King Lear by Joseph Papp, God bless his soul, okay. uh, in, with James Earl Jones as the lead, you know, as Lear. Mm -hmm. She was Cordelia. And of course, Ellen and uh, Rosalind were the, you know, the two evil sisters. <laughs> So, yeah, that, that production occurred about, I want to say 1973. I remember going to rehearsals for that. Um, if it was 73, it, it, um, uh, that would have been the uh, summer of 1973. It was the summer. It was the summer. Cause... All right. And that was right around the time I finished the script. And uh, Sydney was already getting feedback from um, Warner Brothers Studio. Uh -huh. So he was already looking for his cast then, I'm sure. That's amazing. Wow. That's that's just amazing how things work out. Yeah, I remember just just as a as an honorable mention, of course Ralph <laughs> Ralph Julia was in that. Paul Servino was was in that. Uh, oh. Renee what's Renee's last name? I want to say Renee Aubergeois. He was like the redhead. Yeah. Yes, the yeah. To quite the cast there. I remember when it was done. I did not see uh, uh, that production of Lear, but I do remember uh, remember it at the time because uh, I was having a lot of uh, involvement with uh, public. I had a, I had two plays that had been produced at the public by that Which time, one? and so I was always uh, uh, down downtown uh, at the public and hanging around. And um, I do remember play? the buzz about Lear. Wait. Well, one was called The Black Terror. That was in 1971. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other was a one act that um, was part of a series of plays that uh, Novella Nelson uh, produced at the public. Uh, Getting It Together uh, was the name of it. And Chris Kaiser, who later uh, became a producer with uh, Sydney's company, directed it. 
and um, another friend of your mother's, Beverly Todd, Beverly Todd. was in the cast, and um, Morgan Freeman was the was the co-star. He was the uh, the other actor who was uh, the other lead in it. Wow. I'm really enjoying this conversation with you. I hope everyone else is enjoying it as much as I am. Of course, the, the pool was, was much smaller then. I mean, now, thank goodness, we have, you know, much more going on, you know, with, with actors of color, uh, black actors, mm -hmm. whatever you want to say, brown. Um, but, you know, mm -hmm. then in the 70s, it was really, well, you know, as Sydney said, you know, Sydney just said to me, uh, Yes, I mean, I knew who your mother was because she was a known quantity, you know, at that time. I mean, I'm just thinking how many, how many black actors, you know, actually had regular screen time uh, in television at that time. I mean, when you think about it, it's like you had Morgan, you had Bill, and you had Mom all in the show. Mm -hmm. so, so that's three. Of course, there was little Irene Cara. But I'm trying to think, mm -hmm. you know, of any other shows that actually aired, of course, other than, uh, you know, Red Fox's show. I, I remember. Um, in 1973. Um, oh, uh, oh boy! Wow, you kind of got me there. Uh, um, I know the Norman Lear shows were out by that time. Um, they were they were doing different things. Uh, Fox. I think Fox had Sanford and Son. Right, Sanford and Son. That's what I mean. But other than that, yeah. you know, because the the only other show that I remember that was also brief was Diane Carroll's show. Uh, oh yeah. You know, there was um, Room Two Twenty Two, right? Uh, Room Two. Nicholas, Room Two Twenty Two, and then there was. Yeah, Netflix and Diane show. Carroll did have a show. Julia. Julia. Yeah, she sure. was um, a nurse who had been, uh, who was a Vietnam War widow, and she was raising a son alone. And uh, the actor Lloyd Nolan was her, was a co-star in that. And then there were other uh, black uh, actors who were, uh, they they had feature roles on cop shows and detective oh, shows yes, and things yes, like that. And uh, Gail Fisher uh, was on that show, uh, Mannix. In fact, she won an Emmy for her performance on that show. And um, there were a couple of others. I mean, it, there were there were breakthroughs, and um, that period, um, 1973, 74, was considered uh, a, a a period where there was a lot that was happening on television, um, and it was translating into the movies uh, because of uh, what was then beginning to become known as the uh, black exploitation period. The people who know me know I don't particularly like that term, but um, but that's generally a, the accepted. Movies. I mean, they were action movies. That's the way I always saw they them. They, they were either action yeah. movies. Um, yeah, I mean, because you can't call Cornbread Earl and Me um, a black exploitation no, film. You all. can't call, um, you know, I, you know, you can't call Mahogany a black exploitation film. Uh, but when you blanket all of those films with that same uh, connotation, black exploitation. then what you are doing is uh, you're, you're not allowing any substantive uh, critique of the era to take, to take place because that term black exploitation was used to denigrate films, not uplift them or not define them. And even though um, the term originated with Ironically enough, the, the director of the Hollywood branch of the NAACP, he wasn't even necessarily using that term to put films down. But that's ultimately what happened. All of the films were, uh, they, they became, well, it's just, it's, it's black exploitation. Uh, you know, they're cheaply made. Uh, they're not, uh, um, uh, there's no real artistry to them, you know, which really really well i would put any one of pam greer's performances in coffee uh sheba baby um and uh there was a third one there i always forget friday foster 
those are those are probably her three best known films from that that period. Oh yeah, Foxy I Brown. put her performances in those films up against anything that Gloria Graham did during the nineteen fifties. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. you know, and I'll start with Gloria Graham. I go all the way over to Elizabeth Scott, Jane Greer. You know, all these famous femme fatales from all those uh, uh, film noir movies in the nineteen fifties. Marie. Um, uh, Marie Windsor, I think her name was, you know, and Pam Greer holds her own with all of them. And if you're going to give those other actresses all these props for the work that they did during the 1950s in those films, Pam Greer certainly, you know, uh, deserves some of the same consideration. Considering she was in films that had similar shooting schedules, similar budgets, and similar plot lines with the exception being that Pam Greer carried her films, whereas those other actresses were just featured characters in theirs. Well, yes. I mean, I love Pam Greer. I'll start from there and keep, don't get me started oh, on that Pam one. Pam Greer, I mean, it was good enough for Quentin Tarantino. I mean, you know, that scene in Foxy Brown when she's walking down the hallway, you could just watch her walk down the hallway forever. But when did you two actually meet? Right after the uh, completion of Uptown Saturday Night, we met for the first time. Oh. Um, there was there that were these big events being held in New York uh, when the film premiered. Um, and that was the first time that we actually met in person. Uh, prior to that, um, we knew we knew each other by our professional reputations, uh, or should say we knew of each other. Um, and we had, and we certainly had mutual friends, uh, but we had never met in person. Okay, so you met for the first time at the premiere of Uptown Saturday Night. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I remember Mom getting, you know, getting dressed up for that. <laughs> and if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I believe that Coretta Scott King was at that premiere. Is that correct? There were a lot of celebrities. She may indeed have been at that premiere that night. There were a lot of major people who came out, um, you know, uh, from Belafonte. Uh, uh, there were just a lot of people. Um, I, re I just remember uh, Sydney taking me around, and I was shaking a lot of hands. And uh, it, it was all a whirlwind because uh, I was also, uh, you know, I, I brought um, – my mother over, I was trying to, you know, I, uh, uh, keep an eye out for her. My aunt and um, uncles, uh, they came and I was trying to make sure that they were settled. And so my mind was in a thousand and one different places at, at the same time, but I do remember shaking a lot of hands. I that remember- very heady for you also. Um, it was, I was uh, 26 years old. 26? Um, yeah. Um, I, remember thinking very distinctly I have no business being here I am way too young for any of this this is 10 years before I ever thought I would even have a shot at something like this what next Congratulations. <laughs> well as it turns out what next was let's do it again the question did you and Lee have an opportunity to speak at all or as you say it was just so I guess I'm wondering when you actually became buddies and when your first... Um, we spoke that night, um, but most of the time when we talked, it was by phone, and it was... Um, uh, and that was because I don't remember exactly when, but at, one, at some point, you know, your mother, she had to pack up and she moved to the West Coast. I was only out in California intermittently. Like if there was a project that I was being considered for, I was usually flown out there, would take the meetings and everything, and then I'd come back to New York because uh, I spent my entire career on the East Coast. I never really moved out to L.A. Um, well, my mother and, didn't actually move. Well, let me think about this. Yeah. My mother ended up moving out. Well, moving. We all ended up moving. <laughs> <laughs> to the West Coast, we all ended up moving to San Francisco because we weren't particularly interested. My parents were not particularly interested in living in Los Angeles, all the drama. Mm -hmm. I wanted to live in a city that resembled 
New York City where we could walk and, you know, all of that, hopefully have some more interaction. So San Francisco was settled upon and my mother did commuting on the little, whatever it was called, Spirit or whatever that little commuter yeah, was. Yeah, um, uh, South, Southwest Airlines. No, it wasn't. I don't Pacific, uh, but it was, it was uh, PSA. It was... Uh, Something it was Pacific something Airways. Yeah, it was, and you could fly back and forth for like you could fly yeah. like fifty dollars or something. Yeah, it was almost like a shuttle flight. It yes. was a shuttle flight, and mm -hmm. she ended up. The reason why we mo did that is because, of course, now that she'd been in in these two feature films with Sydney, and you know she'd had a series <laughs> of successes. She had the Electric Company, and then, you know, she got these roles in the film, and she had done mm -hmm. King Lear and, and all of that with Joseph Papp. And then she ended up getting the television series uh, starring Richard Crenna, Crenna and Bernadette Peters, um, all Oh, um, uh, yeah. Michael uh, Keaton, pre-Batman, but that was back mm -hmm. in 76. So at that point, you know, you have these separations, you know, from being a family, because when you do a shoot, I mean, she was gone for six months at a time, you know, to do that shoot. And that, that was not an easy thing to go through. You don't want to be separated from your family. So they just, just decided, well, you know, since your career is going so well, and it seems like most of your work is now coming from the West Coast, you know, let's pack up and move to the West Coast. So that's where we ended up settling in 76. And so she did that television series for um, about a year or so. Uh, I'm trying to remember how long she was on that. And then, you know, other things came out of that. You know, she ended up working with James Earl Jones again on Paris. Um, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. You know, James at 16, she ended up doing uh, Roots the second generation because James Earl Jones played the author uh, Alex, uh, Alex Haley um, Alex Haley yeah um, yeah I almost Haley. got the right for that series yeah <laughs> still kick myself for missing out on that um, so that's how you ended up speaking more was actually when she was on the west coast but then it was so it was like you know, two yes. things going in the opposite direction. Well, it doesn't seem mm -hmm. to have Im 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 impeded your friendship. I guess you must have had some very long phone conversations. What did you guys talk about? Well, we, you know, we talked about during those times, we talked about opportunities to, to, to work together again. You know, um, you know, she told me she was doing live stage work um, or wanted to do live stage work on, um, on, on the West Coast and everything. I was aware of the Los Angeles, it was back then it was called the Los Angeles Theater Center, but it has a different name now. Um, and it's a much bigger um, uh, operation. Um, uh, uh, no, it's the Los Angeles Theater Center now. Back then it was the Los Angeles Actors Theater, L-A-A-T. And um, I have been trying to uh, work up um, a, rep uh, a relationship with LAAT, and Lee was talking about, you know, doing more stage work on the West Coast. And so that was something that we talked about. Um, she had some ideas uh, that she wanted to pursue. Do you remember what those ideas were? There were concept pieces, it seemed like, and, and one woman shows um, which uh, I knew I didn't have a real strength uh, uh, as far as writing uh, was, but I also had, you know, uh, thoughts. Um, I had read about um, people like Harriet Tubman, Ida Wells, uh, Ida B. Wells in particular, and I wanted to write something about Ida B. Wells and um, her emergence as a journalist uh, from the late 1890s and um, her work in civil rights all through the early years of the 20th century up until she passed away. We wanted to come back to that, but um, then we got involved with other things. Um, she did not have the playwrights, you know, she did not have the, the, the playwrights theater, uh, not the playwrights theater, but the, um, the theater that she was that uh, she became involved with because uh, she founded a theater I think at one point. The page that you are on uh, that we're broadcasting on right now is called Leeching mm -hmm. Playwrights in Project, 
And the reason why she founded this back in, sheesh, I mean, we're, you know, we're going back to about 2011, you know, when, yeah. when, she, start, when she started this process. So she had 2011, yeah. 2012, 2013, then she passed in 2014. So she only had about two and a half years. So what what motivated her to do it was is that when she wrote her own um, when she wrote her own plays when she wrote Strutton and she wrote Objects in a Mirror mm -hmm. are, are closer than they seem it was just a real struggle trying to get support. Uh, you know, she to talked get about that and and it was very very frustrating for her because of course it's not like. You know, she wasn't known, but of course, you know, the perception of women in the, the entertainment arts, you know, if you're not a certain age, you know, there's definitely ageism involved, being a black actress and, you know, being a person of color, it just goes on and on. So she just said, this is really, really hard for me. She, she decided that she was going to establish the Playwrights In Project to nurture playwrights of color in particular, you know, she wanted to do that for women so people wouldn't have to go through the same thing that she went through. So she did manage to uh, get nonprofit status. Eventually, she ended up in Paris because that is the cultural mecca of, of France. And she did manage to bring out Youssef Miller, who mm. is a playwright, and she brought out Judy Ann Elder. Oh, yes. Director. And basically had Yousef and Judy Ann, you know, work together for five days. You know, she read through the play, she made her notes, and he had to go back and rewrite, bring the notes out again the next day, reread the notes. You know, but, you know, give corrections. I mean, work very closely together. You know, as a as a playwright and a director. And then by the fifth day, actors turned up for the reading of this and. So they would, you know, read the lines. He would sit back and watch it. And then you take notes on it. You know, the director, of course, would have their input. Go back to the, you know, the drawing board, as it were, and make revisions based on, you know, what had occurred that day. And then at the end of the 10 days, uh, have one day to actually mount this reading invite mm -hmm. the audience, uh, which actually it, it was well attended. So I can see now by talking to you, and in particular, you know, this this uh, project that you were talking about, Ida Wells, that in her mind, she just said, you know what, I'm just going to have to do this myself. So that's when she started turning to, you know, writing and playwriting and mm -hmm. writing novels or, what you know, whatever that she could to get to a point where... Initially, you know, she wanted to do her own plays, but again, is that proved to be next to impossible? I mean, it was very disappointing. It was very, very disappointing. Well, people that the, for years just dismissed her, you know, sort of dismissed mm -hmm. her and her dis dis dismissed her gravitas. And um, she you know, credit to her, she just dug in her heels and just kept going. So she found funding for the first season, and I mean. Talk about determination. Talk about well. It's you know um, the way this business you know sometimes plays out. That kind of determination is necessary. The process that you're describing in terms of how she developed her plays, um, that process um, is similar to the to to what we used to do at the O'Neill Theater Center uh, up in Connecticut, and I think. Um, uh, Lloyd Richards, um, the director, he at one time was the artistic director of the uh, O'Neill. And I believe he did have your mother up there one year. I do remember her mentioning the O'Neill. I don't mm -hmm. recall what she was doing up there. Well, I have, I have no doubt she was, she was up there creating. She had to have been in a creative, um, a situation. Uh, she, I, if she wasn't writing, your mother was acting. She was part of that summer's acting company, mm -hmm. um, and uh, for some reason, that does ring a bell with me because that was one of our conversations was about the O'Neill, 
And we were talking about the O'Neill. We were talking about that playwright's development process that the O'Neill had. Ah, okay. And um, and and it would not surprise me at all if she had adopted some of that to the way she wanted to have plays developed uh, in her own uh, circumstance, whether it was be whether in in one case before she founded the theater and certainly after she had the theater set up because because it's a it's an incredibly fruitful process um it's all encompassing um it's incredibly collaborative um and uh and also uh, very nurturing for an artist um, you see your work come alive. You're working with actors. You have this instantaneous uh, circumstance in which um, actors are reacting to your to each line of dialogue right there um, yeah. in real time, and there and an ongoing uh, conversation is being held. If you're if you're working on something and you're not sure uh, of yourself thematically. Uh, in terms of where you want your play to go, if you're not sure about the the arc of the protagonist uh, in your play, now suddenly you're, you're in a workshop mode. You're writing, the words are now being projected on on uh, and, uh, on stage or around the table, um, and you're dealing with the process of in of instantaneous changes being made right there on the spot. It's a little bit, you know, it, it's much more engaging and it's, and it's a hell of a lot different than sitting in a room by yourself and everything is happening inside your head. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering what year this was because she ended up producing or getting Strutton produced at Roselle, mm -hmm. Roselle Noir's Theater, uh, you know, on, on Fifth Avenue, um, mm -hmm. which was a musical that she, you know, wrote. Mm -hmm. Wrote the music and directed, uh, and she won. They ended. She ended up winning a lot of Bernard Marsh. Uh, ended up doing the choreography for it, uh, and they won just a slew of awards. I mean, I think they like they won best musical, best choreography, best this, best that. I think she won about eight awards, and that was around. 1988. That was when she. I was, was thinking that was the at, 80s. I thought it was 85. So it was 1988. I'm just wondering if that was the play that she was working on when she was at the O'Neill Theater in Connecticut. That that I'm trying to get you to tell me what year you had that conversation with her about the O'Neill Theater when she was. Oh there. boy. Um, well, we it was during the 1980s, but it wasn't as late as 1988. It was earlier. Okay. Um, yeah, because I, um, during the 1980s, I was at the O'Neill, uh, uh, 81, 82, 83, and 84. But after 1984, I never was, I didn't go back to the O'Neill, um, again. Um, I was there in the seventies and I was there in the eighties, but after that, um, uh, I, I, I didn't return. So the, whatever that conversation was that we had, it was like I would. I really think it was more like 1983, somewhere. It was either 83, 84, 85, and it was during um, the summer. Yeah, well, that that would make sense. I mean, you're you're probably more accurate. I have to like check my memory because I think that I'm also merging, you know, memories with the end of her stint at All My Children because mm. in that time also she was playing Pat. Pat Baxter, because they didn't use her that much. She used to say, you know, they pay me to write. So, but because she was under contract, they had to pay her. So, but, you know, instead of just twiddling her thumbs, that's when she really had that time and that kind of financial support to do, to do that writing. So it wouldn't have surprised me if, you know, she'd been on some break or something like that for all my children and that's when she ended up going up to the O'Neill because she was on all my children for for quite for course, a yeah, time. yeah um eight, uh, you know eight years or ten know, years I think I think it was more like ten it mm -hmm. was a, it was close to a decade it, it really was it was but she ended up see I know this she ended up leaving because I, I had been living with her at her apartment mm -hmm. uh, for 
few months or something because she used to live on the east side to me that she was moving back to california because she wanted to pursue screenwriting and she felt that that's where she needed to be and then suddenly i was like oh well i guess i'm gonna go to paris because for, i had some opportunity to go to paris to to you know to pursue some career things as well and that's when you know we mm -hmm. split because i literally was like it's like, well, you're out of it. You're out of an apartment, kid. What are you gonna do? <laughs> so I just got myself a one-way ticket to Paris and <laughs> went to Paris, and my mother went to California. That is so funny. Yeah. Um, we, sh your mom and I, should have run into each other in L.A. Certainly in the early 1990s. Uh, the director, uh, Oz Scott, and I had a development deal at 20th Century Fox uh, across two years. I think it was 1991 and 1992, or else it was 1992 and 1993. Right in there, and and your mom was definitely in Los Angeles at that time because I remember she was living in Santa Monica. And she had one, you know, and I, cause I went to visit her, I went to visit her about 93 or so. And I have a picture of her and I standing outside because, uh, my dad, you know, her ex-husband mm -hmm. and Chamberlain had driven me all the way down from San Francisco. We took the scenic route and ended up in Santa Monica, mm -hmm. a snap of us, you know, outside on the, on the sidewalk, uh, when she was living in Santa Monica. Yes, indeed. The fault is is really mine because um, I, I I stayed um, at Oz and Lynn's place and they live in uh, Sherman Oaks, and I had my own rental car, and I used to drive all over the place, and to get from um, where Oz and Lynn lived out to Santa Monica um, is no problem at all. It is so easy. It's unbelievably easy. It's embarrassingly easy. <laughs> when I think about it, and I didn't. We're glad you're here now. Sydney, Sydney Poitier and I um, had come up with a a third film after Uptown Saturday Night. Uh, the Uptown Saturday Night, let's do it again. And there was another film. It was going to be called The Six of Us. And I think I might have told you about this in a right. previous yeah. phone call. That was the one. Uh, where um, I was writing a role that was very specific for your mother, um, and uh, it was it was an it, it was based on an idea that Sydney had, and um, that in that one because um, I still have a copy of the script somewhere. There's a role in that film that was very specific. Um, I want a copy. Um, I want a copy. <laughs> I've got to find it first. Yeah, I've got to find it. <laughs> so you were saying that this story was supposed to be about yes. college alumni who were trying to yes. save their black university from yes. financial, you know, demise. And that that right. had been rejected by the studio and that that was quite the blow, you know, to Sydney. Do you want to elaborate on that a little bit? Well, yes, it was. Um, uh, it was it was a blow to everybody who was involved. Uh, the uh, Mirish brothers, uh, Walter Mirish, uh, people who had produced the the movie Guns, uh, the Guns of Navarone, and a number of other major films during the '60s. Um, Sydney was uh, uh, was in a development deal with them. Everybody was based over at Universal at the time, um, and Let's Do It Again had. I had already been released. Uh, Sydney had two major hit films under his belt. And um, this was not going to be a, a film comedy, however. This particular film was going to be a little bit more dramatic. Um, and uh, there would be comic elements in it. And your mother was to play the uh, person who kind of organizes this entire event. Uh, it's her idea, and her she character. sends for uh, her character, and her character was the one who sent for Sidney Poitier's character, and uh, the uh, other uh, 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 person was to be played by the uh, actor um, Calvin Lockhart. 
Oh, man. Uh, uh, Sydney had made phone calls, preliminary phone calls around. He had talked to some people. Um, and the six of us basically um, were on the male side, Sydney, Calvin Lockhart, and John Amos. And on the women's side, Lee Chamberlain, Denise Nicholas, and I forgot who the third one is now. Because uh, he, he had called, he had either called or, or, or had some indication that all of those actors would be available. It was going to be the same kind of financial arrangement that had been made uh, with all the different uh, uh, leading uh, uh, personalities who had played in Uptown Saturday Night and Let's Do It Again. I think it was uh, Most Favorite Nations Contract. That, that was the, uh, the, the term that was used. What the studio basically told Sidney um, they were hoping for another comedy from him, and um, that was why they said no. Gee, Sydney, we were hoping for another comedy. Right. And, um, you know, well, Sydney was very, very, he was bitterly disappointed um, over it. But had, had he made that film, I have to tell you, had he made that film, it's very unlikely that uh, the movie A Piece of the Action would have been made because that was the film that was made in place of it. We look back and we wish that he would have had the, the tools, as such as a Kickstarter campaign or a GoFundMe. Yeah, this was before all of that. The yeah. You, studio, <laughs> I'm going to make this picture anyway and just, you know, crowdsource and raise the funds or do whatever I need to do and, and get it done. You know, it's just, it's just, uh, yeah, it. Uh, the, uh, but that was, you know, that that was uh, nineteen seventy five, maybe nineteen seventy six. It was somewhere in there. Sure. Um, the kind of business environment, um, the kind of social environment, the kind of political environment that exists today, that makes it possible for there to be um, a Tyler Perry. Mm -hmm who owns his own studios down in Atlanta, Atlanta, Georgia, or Will Packer, who I think uh, up to this point now has been involved in, in uh, producing close to more than 10 or 15 films, um, uh, feature films. Um, the, you know, there was no Shonda Rhimes, uh, you know, back then. This other young man who recently um, uh, just signed this, this huge uh, contract, uh, to uh, uh, lead on, on some new television show, or someone like my nephew, uh, Chael Coker, who um, has got this big um, um, mega bucks deal with uh, Amazon, you know, <laughs> working on a level that I could only have dreamed of back, uh, you know, you know, right. twenty and thirty years ago. Well, um, you know, if he wouldn't be where he was is today without you and everyone else well 30 years ago. i think that's you know that. and i think that that's i think that's something that um people in my age group um and and the people who worked during the 70s uh and 80s that that we pretty much accept just as the just as like sydney's generation the lou gossets and the ossie davises and um you know and 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 so many others um we stood on their shoulders and they stood on the shoulders of, of uh, the filmmakers who came, the Bill Greaves and the, uh, Spencer Williams and um, uh, the filmmakers who came before them. And those filmmakers stood on Oscar Michelle's uh, shoulders, you know. So uh, across all of these, you know, it's been 100 years now. This is uh, 2019. In 1919, Oscar Michelle made his first film, you know. So across a hundred years, from Oscar Michelle to today, you know that's been that's been the real progress. That's the progress that that and the and the history that um, all of us, including your mother, are a part of. You know, and that we have made happen, and um, it's something for us to really be uh, you know very proud of, and 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 ever cognizant of. Um, I remember, you know, back when, you know, when Oz and I were the young bloods coming up and everything, we were very impatient. We were very much aware of 
the doors that were still closed. And um, it's only now when we look back that we that uh, some of us are, are seeing like, wow, we, wow, we, dang, we did a lot. Well, the kids today are very impatient because they are aware of doors that are closed. Um, and even though they are enjoying um, certain um, levels of success that we had um, uh, never enjoyed back in 1970 and 1980 and everything, they are part of that continuing history and they ultimately are going to be the shoulders that another generation is right. going to stand on. There's a couple of films that, that are coming to mind as you speak, you know, a movie like Black Panther, which actually shows mm -hmm. like science and sci-fi and, you know, sort of combines all these different elements and, and of course, history and linked to ancestry and tradition, but also moving forward and, you know, mm -hmm. all, all that type of thing was was fun you know it was it was just it embodied a lot of things then there is um the movie it feels it's about the the brilliant uh female black mathematician oh hidden, hidden behind, figures sorry hidden, hidden figures. figures who was behind uh you know nasa and you know all this <laughs> all this you know success that the corporate white male, you know, took for himself. And, you know, I mean, this person was probably having a nervous breakdown, you know, just trying to deal with so much baloney, you know, every day while being a mathematical genius at, at NASA. And then, you know, there's, there's other stories too, you know, the one that Oprah did about that. Henrietta Lacks. Henrietta Lacks. So, so many different things that are coming out, but the great thing is that, you know, they are coming out and they are starting to showcase, you know, a broader uh, human experience, you know, mm -hmm. um, other than just being a, a necessarily a gangster or, a, you know, prostitute or a drug, you know, a drug addict or what have you. I mean, but it's just nice to see perceptions opening up and history being discovered just in the past few years. You know, today your movie could be made. It's just the six of us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we should think about that, Richard. Well, <laughs> well, um, I yeah, I have to find a copy, but um, uh, from uh, I, I'm always cognizant of the legalities involved. It, you know, Sydney owns the copyright to it. You still got to get Sydney's permission. I'll ask him. Trust me, I'll ask him. <laughs> Definitely. Actually, I owe him a New Year's card. I mean, he he's such a... I, I so enjoyed spending time with him. You know, I got to spend about an hour or two with him. And, and uh, you know, he's in his 90s. And, I mean, what yes. well-spoken, eloquent, elegant, thoughtful... He will be... Um... Man. I mean, just beautiful. He, he'll be 92 February, uh, I think it's February the 20th. Yeah, it was wonderful speaking with him. And he had pictures of my mom in his <laughs> office, in the drawer. Yeah. And, you know, we, we talked about things. And he was like, I have her right here. And he said, you know, she was a, she's a part of history. We're part of the same history. She's part of my history. You know, she was like a sister to me. She always felt like a sister. So, I mean, it, it, it may be more complicated than me just asking permission, but it may not be. Sometimes all you need to do is ask. And you can ask my mother. I'm never afraid to ask. I will ask. I'm like, no, the worst they can say is no. I mean, or, or they can say, well, yes, but it's contingent upon, you know, this and this and this. I mean, cert you know, certain things have to be you know, certain requirements have to be met, you know, to get through to that. But, but why not? Because it's, uh, it's, I think it's, I think it's a very timely, it's still, you know, a very timely topic and able to bring to light that the fact that, yes, you know, people of color do attend university. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. And, you know, no, it, 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 it um, goes on there is important. It's, it's an important, yeah. it's an important story. Sydney um, 
you know, Sydney is the um, uh, author of this of the story that I would have based um, uh, the uh, ultimate script on, or actually that I did base the script on because it was written. Um, most of that script is timely. There there are certain elements of it that are not because uh, the script was written for a generation of of uh, college students who were active in the civil rights movement. Um, and now we're picking them up uh, 20 years later. Um, so it was a movie that was written specifically for characters who would have been coming of age um, in, uh, you know, like during the 1970s. But if that, but there are other elements of, uh, of that film that involve gentrification, that involve the financial uh, health of uh, HBCUs, that um, involves Mm -hmm. uh, romance, love, um, uh, involve uh, certain elements of danger. There's a, there, there are all these different components in the film, um, uh, in the story itself, that uh, don't require um, uh, updating. So, you know, basically, um, you know, at its core, it's a movie about Black upwardly mobile, <laughs> you know, middle-aged people who are uh, coming to terms with, um, uh, with their lives moving forward and with uh, changes that they helped bring about and um, uh, aspects of their own lives that they still have to, um, uh, you know, pull together. It's a very adult film um, uh, on, on a number of different levels. I'd love to see uh, someone tackle it. I mean, you know, now they can remake uh, Uptown Saturday Night, and um, I know that somewhere out there um, there's a a new version of Native Son that was recently completed. I don't know uh, when its release date is. Um, well, then, you know, this uh, this uh, the six of us. Someone should be talking to Sydney about that script. Yes, Sydney retired from acting. Um, he did not necessarily retire um, altogether from the from the um, from being involved in the business itself itself. Um, so, hmm. <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe you know. I have. I I always give him a phone. Uh, you know, I always call him around his birthday. I will certainly bring this up next time I speak with him. Well, and tell him that Lee's daughter put the bee in your bonnet. And um, I just want to say, Richard, that it's just so been so, so nice to have you here with us today. And we have all learned so much listening to you. And your students are so fortunate to have you as a professor. You are a treasure trove of knowledge. So well, thank you.